Thank you for listening to this weekly podcast from the City Church, a ministry in Springfield, Massachusetts, which is seeking to reveal Christ, reconcile people, and renew our city. For more information about the City Church, or additional media and other resources, or to make a tax-deductible donation that will further spread the gospel in Springfield and beyond, please visit thecitywithin.org. We now take you to part two of our sermon series entitled, Power and Presence. This week, Pastor Anthony Wirth will be discussing 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 17, and the power to sanctify. Welcome to the City Church. Uh, my name is Anthony, if you didn't catch it during announcements, uh, and it's my honor and privilege to be the lead pastor here. Um, would like to start just by saying welcome, especially if this is your first time. I'm glad that you're here. Would love to be able to meet you if I haven't already, if after service you'd want to introduce yourself and I can introduce myself to you. Um, should also let you know if this is your first time or if you weren't here last week, that you're stepping into part two of a sermon series. And what we mean by that is that as we gather together here, whether it's a Saturday evening for worship or a Sunday morning, we take some significant time in the middle of our gatherings to open up the scriptures, the Bible, and to study them. And we do that primarily because we believe that the God of the universe who spoke and brought it into existence has also spoken through the scriptures, revealing himself, who he is and what he's like. And so we say, well, if God's willing to do that, we want to learn about him. And so the way that we do that, the way we learn about God and we learn the scriptures here at our church is we take a a theme or a topic uh, or even one of the books of the Bible and we look at it for several weeks in a row. And so, as I mentioned last week, we started this sermon series that we've titled Power and Presence, as you just saw in the trailer and you see hanging behind me. And what we're talking about, what we're thinking through and what we're considering is really the third person of the Trinity. And so here at our church, we believe in a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, as revealed in the scriptures, all equal in dignity, value, and worth, all God, but different persons, and therefore playing out different roles. And so the Father creates the plan, he sends the Son to fulfill the plan, Jesus rises from the dead, he sends the Spirit to be his presence here in this world, so they're playing out different roles. And one of the most neglected or misunderstood people of the Trinity is the Holy Spirit. And so what we're doing is we're considering um, who he is and what he does, or what we might say is his, his person and his work. And so we're spending several weeks just kind of looking at how the Spirit works in the world and how He works in the life of a believer and how He wants to work through us. And so it might sound kind of strange, kind of weird, but I think extremely important for us. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to look at the idea, the concept that the Spirit uh, gives us the power to sanctify or to be sanctified. And uh, that's kind of a weird word. And even right now, you're probably like, maybe I've never even heard that word before. It's one of those Christianese kind of terms. Um, but we'll dig into it, and I think you'll find it to be um, very helpful. And so I'm going to pray, if you wouldn't mind praying along with me, and then uh, we'll get into this morning's message. So let's pray. God, we, we come before you as... Uh, as people who who want to experience you. I can't imagine that there's any other reason, even if it's not the surface level reason for most of us here, um, that is why we're here. Even if there's many other things that we would rather do, deep down something has compelled us to be here and I know it's that we just want to know you more. We want to experience you and so God, would you please Would you please make yourself known in such a profound and personal way to us this morning that it would be impossible for us to deny your presence and not just your presence as sort of out there, but your presence here and not even just in this room, but in us. God, we ask this not because by any means, not by any means that you have to answer our prayers, but by your sheer grace and mercy, according to your son and in his name, We ask these things, and all God's people said, amen, amen. 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 So I'll bet for every single one of us, uh, we could agree that at some some point in our lives, um, especially growing up, whether it was a, a parent or a coach or a teacher or even some other relative, they said something to you along the lines of, be careful who you're hanging out with. Did you get this when you were a kid? Did your parents say this to you, anybody, right? My parents did. 
Um, and of course, the reason behind it was because you tend to become like the people that you hang around with, right? The people that you're around the most, the people who are most present in your life seem to have the greatest impact on you, right? And it could be your family, which for many of us it is. I'll bet most of us as adults, we might look at our lives right now and think to ourselves, I'm just like my dad or I'm just like my mom and that's not what I wanted at all. You probably hear that all the time. Maybe you're experiencing that. And what happened there? Well, they were so present in your life that they made an impact on you and you just became like them. This is the same with, with teenagers. That's why your parents say those sorts of things. But it even, it even happens in work environments, right? So I remember right after I finished culinary school, um, I got this job at a catering company and the boss there had a tremendous impact on me, at least the way that I did my work. And then if you're married, you know that your spouse has a huge impact on you as well. In fact, they've said that as you grow old with your spouse, you tend to look alike even. I was gonna look up some pictures just to show you, but I thought that would be going too far. But this is true, right? Whoever has the greatest presence in your life tends to have the greatest impact on you. They seem to, even inevitably, without even wanting to necessarily, shape you and mold you and make you into somebody different. They shape your personality, your, your likes, your dislikes, all of this, right? I wanna to submit to you that, that God, in sending his spirit, at least in part, has sent his spirit to be such an overwhelming presence personally that, that he wants to shape us and mold us. And that's one of the main reasons that he sent his spirit. And so I wanna think about this and the idea of sanctification, which I'll open up for you and define for you in a few minutes. Um, in this one passage in 1 Corinthians chapter three, we're gonna look at verses 10 through 17. Um, well, we're gonna read verses 10 through 17, but we're gonna focus primarily on verses 16 and 17. So we'll read the whole thing, um, but then we're gonna go back and read 16 and 17 again. So if you have a Bible, you can go ahead and follow along. If you don't, it'll be on the screen above me as well. But 1 Corinthians chapter three, verses 10 through 17, here we go. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Let's read 16 and 17 again. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is holy and you are that temple. I wanna think about the reality of the spirit's power to sanctify us today under two basic headings. First, sanctification intended for us and then sanctification given to us. So sanctification intended for us, sanctification given to us. Now, before we can even really get into the first point, sanctification intended for us, we have to work on these terms, right? I mean, we have to understand what sanctification even is. It's not a word that we use very often and you might even be wondering why I'm talking about it since it wasn't even found found in the passage in which I just read. So where are we getting this idea from and what does it even mean? Well, interestingly enough, the word sanctification is very closely tied to the word holy. And that's a word used in the passage. Now you wouldn't catch that in English because you say holy or you hear holy and you hear sanctification and there doesn't appear to be any correlation at all because the English language just doesn't put them together like that. However, if you look back into the original languages in which the words were used, you find that they are almost inextricably connected, right? And so Paul the Apostle is the one who wrote this letter. He was writing in the first century to an ancient city or people in a city, that city of Corinth. He's addressing a lot of issues that they had, but he's writing primarily 
primarily in Greek, but Paul himself was actually a Hebrew. So he understood Hebrew and Greek very well, and not just the languages, but even the cultures. And so when he uses these words, he's got some understanding behind them that I think most of us just don't really grasp because the Hebrew and the Greek languages are just far more profound and deep than modern day English. And so what I wanna do is I wanna kind of take you on this little journey of these words first and then begin to understand them more deeply. And so let me show you the word holy in Hebrew and Greek. And pay attention to the, to the actual way that they're spelled and the way that they look and even the way that they sound. So in Hebrew, holy is kadesh. And in Greek, it's hagios. I don't know if I'm pronouncing those correctly, so don't tell your friends that's how you say it. I'm not totally sure. But here's what they basically mean. To be consecrated and dedicated. Holy means to be consecrated and dedicated. And when it's used in these ways, it's an adjective. It's describing something. So something is in this state of having been consecrated or dedicated, and these are the words. So that's holy. That's the word that Paul is using in this particular passage, right? Now notice, when, when we're using the word sanctification, although in English seems like it's not even connected to holy, in Hebrew and Greek, it's deeply connected. So I'll show you. Kadash and hagiazo. They're almost the same exact word. And so this word actually means to consecrate or dedicate. In other words, it's a verb. It's the verb form of the word holy, so making something holy. In other words, this is our definition for sanctification, the act of making holy. So maybe you've never heard the word sanctification before, maybe this is your first time, now you've got a basic definition, the act of making holy. But there's a big problem with this definition for most of us, and maybe we don't even realize it, but it's that last word, holy. Even now we have a definition for sanctification, most of us probably have the wrong definition for the word holy. And here's what I mean. Most of us, um, especially as modern Americans, if we're using the word holy, if we're talking about being holy or becoming holy or trying to be holier, what we're really talking about for most of us is moral purity. And so in other words, we're talking about creating this sort of list of standards and morality and trying to achieve that list. And so if you achieve the list, then you're holy. And if you're trying to achieve more, then you're becoming holier. That's the way most people use the word holy. The problem is though, that's not what Paul meant when he used it, and that's not what God meant when he used it. He meant something far bigger than this. It includes that for sure, but something far bigger than this. And we know this just by looking throughout the scriptures, right? The scriptures, when they use the word holy, it's not limiting it to just moral purity. In fact, Jesus himself, when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's praying. This elaborate and amazing prayer found in John chapter 17. It's amazing. You should read through it. But he says this statement that is rather shocking if you're thinking about this word in particular. Here's what he says in John 17, verse 19. For their sake, he says, I sanctify myself. I consecrate, I dedicate myself. I make myself holy that they also may be sanctified or made holy in truth. Now, if, if Jesus is saying regarding moral purity, if he's saying, I am becoming more morally pure for their sake, we've got tremendous problems, right? The first is that Jesus apparently isn't perfect and morally pure completely. And of course, that's not true. He himself claims to be completely perfect and morally pure in other places in the scriptures. So when he says he's sanctifying himself, he can't mean I'm making myself more morally pure. It's got to be something bigger than that. Not only that, you read through the Old Testament, and in particular in places like Leviticus, you find God call all sorts of things, objects, holy. So you read through Leviticus and you notice he calls, he calls curtains holy, he calls garments holy, he calls tables holy, he calls pictures holy, he calls all sorts of things holy. And of course these things can't become morally pure or more morally pure. So it's gotta mean something far bigger than this, right? And so back to basically what we just said and let's open it up. The definition for holy is this. Consecrated and dedicated, right? We already threw that out, but let's, let's think about this for just a second. What does that mean? These aren't even really words that we use that often, maybe dedicated, but not so much consecrated. And so let's think about this for just a second. To be consecrated actually means to be separated from that which is common or normal. And so it's set apart from common or normal. And to be dedicated is to be separated to something specific. Right? So separated from the common and the normal, but also dedicated to means separated for something in particular and on purpose. Right? And so 
if I were to try to make my table, which if God can make a table holy, if I were to try to make my table holy, I wouldn't kneel before my table and read it the 10 commandments and say, now go and be. That would just be silly. My table can't just go and be, right? So that wouldn't make any sense. If I was gonna make my table holy, an object into something holy, what I would do is I would separate it from that which is common and normal, and I would dedicate it to or set it apart for something very specific. Right? And so maybe you had this growing up where your mom had a special set of dishes and they were separate from all of the normal or common dishes and used only for particular purposes. In a sense, those dishes are holy. They've been sanctified, set apart, right? Or maybe, maybe probably the most common way that we use the word holy in our day is in the title of the book that we just opened up, right? It's called the Holy Bible. And the people who translated the Bible, they understood this concept, not just as moral purity, as if a book could become more morally pure, but really that it was set apart from all other books. It's not just a common book, but it's also dedicated to a specific purpose, namely God and his glory. Now, we're not, when we're talking today about the power to sanctify, we're not talking about sanctification of books or of tables or of curtains or of garments. We're talking about the sanctification of human beings. And so this raises a huge question, and I want to give it to you right here. How are humans sanctified? How is a human being set apart from common and set to something on purpose? How are human beings made holy, in other words, right? And I think you could figure this out throughout the scriptures in a, in a multitude of different ways, but the one way I wanna focus on is what Paul speaks to in this passage. So in this passage, Paul gives the word holy and the people who are holy, he kind of gives this analogy of what that's like or a metaphor even. I'll read it for you again and I've highlighted it for you. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. And so what he says is just as a temple is holy, so you are holy. Just as a temple is set apart, so you are set apart. Just as a temple is set for a specific purpose, so you are set for a specific purpose. Just as it's consecrated and dedicated, you are consecrated and dedicated. You are holy. Now, what this means then is we have to begin to think about temples. And so we're gonna go on what might seem like a rabbit trail, but I guarantee you it'll be worthwhile to sort of figure out what does it mean to be a holy person, to be a sanctified person. So I'm gonna give you six things about temples, okay? Six things about temples. Um, most of them will be rather brief, but hopefully as we get to the end, you'll see why this is so important, right? So the first thing is this, and it's so obvious, right? Temples are holy. Just as Paul had just said, temples are holy, so we just need to understand temples are holy. And what we mean by that is that they are set apart, right? They're set apart from common things and set to something uh, that, is, that is dedicated and different than all other things. And so temples are holy in a multitude of different ways, right? The first way might be the place in which they're located, right? So, so it's set on a particular hill, in a particular city, at a particular place, right? Those sorts of things. The way that it's made, the architecture uh, might set it apart and make it different. But then also maybe Maybe even the story that it tells. So the temple is there for a purpose and it's telling a particular story that no other building is. And so it's, it's set apart. Now in, in our day, we don't deal too much with temples. Most of us probably think that temples are kind of primitive or just useless. And so they're just these buildings that we might check out if we were to go to some place where they're still around. We don't use them very often. So to think of a, a place or a building that is set apart from common use and that is dedicated to a particular use is kind of strange for us. But if you were to step back and, and be a Hebrew, I guess for us, the, the best way to maybe understand a temple um, and this being holy, sort of like putting together maybe the White House, the Washington Monument, maybe the Statue of Liberty, like all together, right? These are, these are separate places. These are separate places. They're, they're put aside for a particular use, right? They're not common. And so the first thing is that temples are holy. The second is this, the Jewish temple was holy. And obviously, right, because this is the temple that Paul's referring to. He's speaking about the Jewish temple. And this temple was entirely set apart. In fact, the way that it was made was such detail and specificity. I mean, you read through First and Second Kings and you come across these passages about the, the, about the temple. You're going to read through them and, and you're going to be like, what is this all about? I mean, all of these details about the colors of the curtains and where they're supposed to be hung and all of the, you know, the materials that things are made of and where they're set. I mean, it's so specific and detailed. And that's just proof that it's totally set apart. And then what can happen in the temple is 
clearly setting it apart from all other places. You read all these laws about who's allowed in and when they're allowed in and what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do, just clearly set apart. But even if you weren't a Jew, even if you weren't a Jew and you lived in the first century and you went into Jerusalem, maybe for your very first time ever, you would be able to tell without a shadow of a doubt that the temple was totally holy. In fact, I'll show you a picture to, to depict it. What you have here is actually a model of Jerusalem in the first century. So these people standing around, they're tourists and they're on the outside of the model. So it's obviously not a full scale model. Um, but what's really interesting is you can walk all the way around and, and just see how, how Jerusalem looked in the first century, right? And notice the temple. I mean, if you look at the size of the city, the temple is like a third of the size of the city. It's huge. If you notice, it's on the highest point. If you walked into Jerusalem and it was your first time, no question, you would be looking at the temple and saying, that's clearly a set apart building. That's not a common building. Everyone could see it and they looked to it all the time to be that sort of different set apart space. They understood this, right? So temples are holy, the Jewish temple is holy. The third thing is this, temples had a purpose, right? Let me hit this in kind of two ways, first generally and then more specifically. So the general purpose of a temple uh, was really to bridge the, the gap between the divine and the human, right? And so every religion that's ever made temples, the reason for it is them basically saying there's divine space and there's human space. And we live in this human space and we can't transcend it to get into the divine space. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna build a temple to get the divine space into our space. And so God or gods dwell in this temple. So that's the general purpose of temples, to bridge these spaces and put them, put them together. Then the Jewish temple was much the same. God had said, I want you to build this temple so that I can reside in it. I want to be amongst you. I want to bring the divine into the human. I want you to construct this space for me to dwell. And so by the very nature of them having the temple meant they had God, God's presence, which nobody else had. And so by nature of them having the temple and God's presence, they were a sanctified people. They were a set apart people, a people different than all other peoples. But not only that, the way that they interacted with the temple sanctified them. They would go and they'd make sacrifices and worship and all of this. And what they were doing was they were separating themselves from that which is common, cleansing themselves of that which is impure to make themselves sanctified or holy. And so the Jewish temple existed for this reason, to sanctify the people. Now that being said, if you're just reading through the Old Testament and you see all these descriptions, or even if you go into Jerusalem and you see the building, on paper, and maybe if you don't even care about it, what this means is you could, you could actually desecrate the temple. And that's kind of our fourth point, is that temples can be desecrated. Now just notice that word for a second here, right? So we talked about consecrated, now we're talking about desecrated. So if consecrated is to set apart from that which is common, to desecrate is to throw it back into that which is common or even impure. And so if something's set apart from common and is set to something dedicated, namely God, then it's actually possible to take this building and to throw it back into which is common and impure and not use it for that thing it was dedicated for initially, essentially taking away its purpose, right? If its purpose was to sanctify, now it's worthless. It's been desecrated. And what's crazy is you read the people of, 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 of God doing this throughout the Old Testament over and over and over again. So in the Old Testament, there's these crazy stories of First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, and maybe you've always wondered like what those books are actually all about. It's really just telling the history of God's people. And what you find throughout this history is that the kings and the priests, the people in leadership who were supposed to be taking care of this temple, making sure it was holy and that it could house God, what they were doing was they were desecrating it. So over and over, they would, they would bring in false gods into this temple. And of course, if God was supposed to be there, he can't dwell there with these other false gods, that's impure. Then they would also exalt themselves as if they were God. And of course, if it's supposed to be dedicated to God, now it's not, they were, they were desecrating it. And so you read throughout the Old Testament and you come across this, this point where God through his prophets is telling him, yo, you're desecrating the temple, my, my place, my home that was set apart. You're desecrating and he's warning him and warning him and warning him. And he says, if you keep this up, I'm gonna kick you out of here and I'm gonna throw this thing to the ground. 
and rightfully so, because at that point it was worthless anyways. And so as they're doing this and these prophets are coming, they're not listening. And so God finally says, all right, that's it. Everybody out. And he sends in Babylon, this ancient empire, to take over the city. They burn the temple to the ground and the people are taken into slavery for 70 years. God, in his mercy though, after those 70 years, decides that he wants, to, he wants them to rebuild the temple. He wants to make his presence known amongst them again. So he sends them back into Jerusalem and through Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, just in case, like kind of Old Testament survey kind of thing here. Through Ezra and Nehemiah, they rebuild this temple. Then they consecrate it, they dedicate it again to God. That's what you read at the end of those stories, them consecrating and dedicating the temple. Now what's crazy is you wouldn't think that, that history would repeat itself in this way when they were in slavery, but it does. And a thousand years or so after the temple, the second temple is built, Jesus steps onto the scene and he goes into this temple. And when he goes in, what he sees is people desecrating it. He sees people bringing it back into that which is common and even impure. And what he does is he constructs this whip of cords, right? And he chases everybody out. And, and according to this, the, the person who's writing the story of what happened, they say that this was reminding everybody about how God said zeal for his house would consume him. And so Jesus steps in, it's his house zeal for it consumes him because it's being desecrated. He kicks everybody out. And so this is what we learn. Now, that being said, before we get into the fifth and sixth points about temples, I think it might be kind of important to step back and, and understand the significance of God's presence amongst people and really how, how crazy and remarkable it is that he would even allow a temple and his presence to be around us. So let's step back and think big story, right? The whole story of God. So in the beginning, God reaches into the dirt and he makes Adam, right? He gives to him a wife, he puts them in this garden. Now at the time, everything is perfect, or we might just be able to say holy. It was consecrated from anything impure and it was dedicated to the specific purpose of God and human flourishing, right? And so this place, God could dwell in. And that's what it actually says in Genesis. God dwelt with his people in the garden because it was a holy place. But as you know, the, it doesn't last very long before they're tempted and they bring sin into the garden and even into the world and into humanity. And at this point, God can't dwell there anymore. It's not holy. And so what God does in an effort to continually reach after human beings is he continues to make space for him in humanity for the sake of his presence to be around, right? And so when you get into the book of Exodus, what you find is God takes the people out of Egyptian slavery. He tells them they can build this tabernacle. This tabernacle is the house of God. It has to be constructed a certain way, but everywhere that they went, they would build this tent and God made his presence among them. He finally takes them into the promised land, this promised place that God has said, this is holy land. He even calls it the holy city of Jerusalem. And he constructs this temple for his presence to be amongst them. And of course they desecrated, he builds another one, but God's just constantly reaching after humanity saying, even though you're unholy, I want to be around you. But the only way I can is if there's a holy place for me to dwell. And so finally, God knowing, right? God knowing from the very beginning and not even just the beginning of what's written, but even into eternity past, knowing that he would make his presence among them and that they would desecrate it over and over and over again. He finally says, you know what though? What would be the greatest attempt of me being around them would be to send myself. And so Christ steps into the world, God himself incarnate, housing as it were, God himself. Him, the embodiment of God, not necessary, not needing a, a temple, but he himself being it. In fact, after Jesus constructed the whip of cords and pushed everybody out of the desecrated temple, here's what he says in Mark chapter 14, I believe. I will destroy this temple that is made with hands. And in three days, I will build another not made with hands. And so, so God in his mercy, even, even when we take his presence and we kick him out, he throws himself in and not just in another temple this time, but himself, the embodiment of who he is. He puts himself into the world. And so the fifth thing that we learn about temples is this. The temples don't have to be buildings. Temples don't have to be buildings. 
And in fact, John, who was one of Jesus' closest disciples, he picked up on this as Jesus was teaching these sorts of things about who he was and the embodiment of God. When he tells the story of Jesus, he reaches back not just to his birth, as you find in other gospel narratives, he reaches back into eternity past to tell the story of Jesus. And in John chapter one, he says these just remarkable words. Here's what he says. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Now he personifies it, right? He was in the beginning with God. And who is this he? Well, look at this. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, Jesus. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Now park on that word dwelt for just a second. When, when John's using this word dwelt, what he most specifically means is sanctified space that God stepped into humanity as sanctified or holy space, that he himself is consecrated, he himself is dedicated, which means by nature, wherever he goes is holy. Wherever he goes, for he himself is holy, wherever he goes is holy. And so you read through the life of Jesus, right? And you find this, this just remarkable thing going on where where even though he is touching things that are impure, things that are not consecrated or dedicated, and in fact, when you touch those things, according to the Old Testament, you're supposed to be made impure, unholy, and then do something about it, sanctify yourself. Jesus is going around touching that which is unholy and not taking on the impurity, but rather giving purity. And so he goes to a leper. You're not supposed to touch lepers, otherwise you're gonna have to sanctify yourself. He touches the leper, the leper is made clean, holy. This woman who's had this blood issue in her body since birth says, if I could just touch his garment, then I could be made clean. And she runs through this crowd and she grabs his garment and he is not made impure, she is made holy. And then you go all the way back into the Old Testament and you've probably wondered this phrase that God is speaking through Moses in this burning bush that is just not consumed. And he says to Moses, take off your sandals for where you are standing is holy ground. And you gotta wonder, like, was that just some amazing sand? No. The reason it was holy ground is because God was there. Amen. Just by the nature of God being there, it is holy, because he is holy. And so this brings us to the sixth point, which is that we are temples. We are now God's temple. So let's flash back to what Paul says. Let's read it again. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you. Amen. You are God's temple. You are his consecrated, his dedicated space. You are, you are space in which God who is holy has made himself present. You are that, which if you're anything like me, you have to step back and ask the question, how does that happen? How on earth does this vessel become a vessel in which God himself lives and dwells? I mean, if God, if God can only live and dwell in holy space, then I would look at my life and I would say, not so much. So how does this happen? And so this brings us really to our second point, which is mostly just, right? And we're asking, how does this happen and what does it matter? And I would say it only matters if we know how, how it happens. So how does this happen again, right? How, how, does this, how does this unholy, impure vessel become a space in which God actually dwells? I would say that the only way that this can happen is exactly or precisely through what Jesus describes. So when Jesus goes into the temple, right, and he says, he says, he will destroy this thing and in three days raise it. He's talking about his own body. And if he were to say to us, if you want to become a temple, I think what he would say is, you have to die. You have to die and be made altogether new. Because you in your current state are unholy and impure and incapable of housing the almighty and holy God. The only way for you to be a place in which God can dwell is for you and who you are to die. Amen. And you read throughout the New Testament, 
to me. And this is exactly what the gospel is proclaiming. It's exactly what it means to become a Christian, is to look at Christ on the cross and say, just as you died, so I have died. And just as you were raised from the dead, so I have been raised and made new. Behold, all things have passed away. The new has come. That's the only way. In, in other words, it's like, like Jesus steps into the scene and he looks around at us as a bunch of unholy and impure vessels, desecrated buildings, as it were. And instead of just passing by us and saying, that's a piece of junk, he looks at it and he says, I'm gonna buy it. And he doesn't just buy it with money. He buys it with his own blood. He buys it with his own body. He buys it with his own life. And when he buys it, when he buys you as the dilapidated building that you are, he doesn't just remodel the kitchen. He raises the thing to the ground and he builds a whole new one. And if you're a Christian today, that's what's happened. When you placed your faith in Christ, what you did, what you did was you said, I am no longer this person. I am new. Altogether, new identity. You have been raised to new life. And now, having been raised to new life, he throws himself into you as you are holy. And he says, I can dwell here. And that's exactly what he does. He dwells in you. And so what does this matter? Well, this, I mean, this has tremendous implications, right? Tremendous implications. First of all, if you're, if you're not a follower of Jesus, this has just huge implications on you, right? So if you're not a follower of Jesus, let me say it first, like, we're glad that you're here. And when we started this church, we started it with you in mind. Like, we, we wanted to create an atmosphere and an environment in which you could come and just learn of Christ and who he is in the scriptures. But this has tremendous implications for you. Because for you, if you're anything like me, I mean, I never heard about Jesus until I was 21 years old. And when I did, I remember the moment that I heard about him and how unholy I was, my first thoughts were, there's no way that the creator of the universe, being as holy and perfect as he is, would ever want to have a relationship with me. I mean, I can look back at my life and just see, see not just all the bad decisions that I made and all the bad things that I said and did, I can see collateral damage in relationships and people that I have probably messed up. And when I look back and I think about it all, I go, man, there's no way that God would be present in my life. And that's just not true. If you want to follow Jesus today and you think that's the case, it's just not true. The reason Jesus stepped into the world was to raise you to new life. And so I would say, trash that concept. It's not true. But also, maybe, maybe you're not a follower and, and you think to yourself, like, this temple that, that, I, that I have right now is meaningless. It's purposeless. It's useless. And I would say to you, that the good news of the gospel is that God can make residence in you and give you purpose and meaning far beyond this life and on into eternity. And so if that's you, trash that too, because that's not Christianity, that's not the gospel. The truth of the gospel is that he stepped in to give you new life. But the reality is most of us are probably followers of Jesus, or at least we would say that we are. And so what are the implications of this for us? And I would say just like if you're not, tremendous implications. If God has made his residence in you, then you, you just recognize a different way of life. Amen. You just recognize a different way of life. If he has purchased you with his own blood, you just recognize that you're not your own anymore. You're not your own. In other words, I remember when, when I first moved out of my parents' house, right, and, and I had a roommate. You've probably experienced this. This was one of my really good friends, and you, you have really good friends until you become roommates, right? And then, and then it doesn't, doesn't play out the way you'd hoped. But, but I, remember, I remember when this, when this happened, and, and we, would, we would get on each other's nerves and stuff, and learning to share space is just extremely difficult. When you're married, it's extremely difficult because you're not just sharing the space of the house. Like, you're, you're sharing emotions and life and relationships, and this requires a constant give and take. And for a Christian, for some of us, the reality is, is that we think that God's not present, that he's sort of just our roommate. And, and we see him in passing, and that's about it. And, and maybe you're wondering, how come he's not present in my life? How come it seems like there's this massive gap between me and him? And here's what I would say to you, follower of Jesus, I love you 
But it's not that he's not present. He is utterly and completely present. Maybe you're not. Maybe God has thrown his entire being into you, which if you're a Christian, he has, and you just keep looking to other things. You keep looking away. You keep desecrating the temple, as it were. And he is right there saying, I'm right here. Why do you keep turning there? Why do you keep bringing this into your life? When I'm right here, you can have all of me. It's not like when you sin, he leaves and then comes back later. That's not the way God works. He is utterly and completely present. And if you're a follower of Jesus today, just turn to him. Just turn to him and turn away from those things that are distracting you from that relationship with him. Now, I, I know I've been... I've been accused in the past of not giving very practical application, right? So, okay, so he's in my life, he's totally present, now what am I supposed to do about that? Now, I'm gonna give you three things, okay? I'm gonna tell you up front that just because you do these three things doesn't mean you're gonna get, you know, goosebumps every time you do them or anything like that. Like, that's not what we're getting at. But the Spirit of God who wrote this book, right, has declared through this book how we can practice his presence. And that's what it is. Practicing the presence of God is building relationship. That's what you do with other relationships. You practice the presence. You go out of your way to be with them, to hang out with them, to learn of them. And throughout the scriptures, we find different means. The first is very clear. It's the scriptures themselves. He has said that he's the one who wrote the book and he's written it about him. So he says, come learn of me. And so Christian, if you're wondering why you don't experience the presence of God in your life, I might ask you, do you even read the scriptures about him? He's saying, here's who I am, here's what I'm like, and you're always just like, nah, never mind. I mean, how do you expect to experience his presence if you just keep pushing him aside? Then also through prayer. In Romans 8, it says that his spirit testifies with our spirit and through groanings from our inner being, we pray. Do you make time to pray? And I mean, I'm all for like shotgun prayers while you're, while you're driving, you're just shooting stuff up to God. You know, that's totally cool, keep doing that. But do you set aside five minutes, 10 minutes, even a week to just say, God, I wanna practice your presence. I wanna be in your midst and I want to know who you are and what it's like to be with you. And then the last one is community. God hasn't given his spirit to dwell just in you as an isolated individual, but in his people. And in fact, when Paul's speaking here, he's talking collectively. He's saying, you all are the temple of God. And so one of the ways that, that we should be experiencing the presence of God is by getting together with other people in which he already dwells and communing with them and learning from them and talking and listening and all of that that is required for community. And so I would just ask you as a Christian, are you going out of your way to practice the presence of God? Because he's there. He's there, arms wide open, and he's been saying to you probably over and over, and you know it, because every time you turn away, you're thinking to yourself, why do I keep doing that? And every time you notice the gap between you and him, you're wondering, why is there this gap? And he's there just saying, come to me, come to me. So if you're not a follower today, I would challenge you. I would challenge you just to reach out to him and say, my life is a mess, but I need you, and I know you can make me new, and I know that I can have this relationship with you. Reach out to him. And if you're not, I would challenge you, I'm sorry, if you are a follower, I would challenge you to just institute some of these disciplines in your life. Now that said, we're going to do this right now. We're actually going to attempt to practice the presence of God. And I'm gonna be totally upfront with you. Practicing the presence of God and practicing any relationship is always awkward. It's always awkward, especially if it's fresh or if you haven't been involved in that relationship for a long time, it's always awkward. But what I would like to do is after I pray, we're gonna play a video of a testimony in which God has been working in somebody's life. And then we're gonna spend some time, just as John comes up, he's gonna just gonna play around on the guitar, just give us some background music and you can stay kneel, I'm sorry, you can stay seated, you can kneel, you can stand, you can do whatever you want. But during that time, just cry out to God in prayer, open up the scriptures, read a passage, read it 10 times, whatever, but take that time, just ask God to reveal himself to you, right? And after he's played for a little bit, he's gonna actually sing a song. And as that song is going on, you can stand if you want, you can stay seated, whatever, whatever, however you want to practice the presence of God is totally fine. But then after that song, I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna introduce communion. And so I'm gonna pray and take advantage of the time. 
right? God has given it to you. He's given it to you. Because you know tomorrow you're not gonna. You know it. So take advantage of it now. Let's pray. Father, thank you for being so good and so gracious to us that you would reach down not just into human history, but into our very souls and minds to reveal who you are and to grant us relationship with you. God, I plead with you for for my soul's sake and the souls of every person in this room, that you by your spirit would awaken us to the reality of your presence in us and that you would stir us and cause us to turn to you, to seek after you. And I pray for those in the room who might not know you. God, maybe for for years and years and years, they've, they've been running away from you and didn't even know it. And you just, today, just showed them who you are. And I pray, God, that you would you would stir them too, cause them to reach out to you and to ask for your presence. Father, by your spirit, meet us in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. So I grew up one of six kids. I have four sisters, I have one brother, and we were raised in a Baptist school and church until sixth grade. My dad came home to my mom cheating on him and life as we knew it, you know, divorce was never something that was even spoken of. Um, and it just became a reality. My mom and my dad tried to make it work like four or five times, which every time just destroyed us. The examples that I had around me, uh, my parental unit wasn't there. So we just were raising each other, basically. My dad worked all the time to support us and did the best that he could. But I still I was in, surrounded by poor friends and, and neighbors that would buy me alcohol, and it was just the, the choices and the patterns that were, were being set um, ultimately led me to a car accident. We heard that a party was going on. We were drinking at my house. Um, I had about six beers, so in my mind, I drank all the time, so I was the, the most sober to drive. And I immediately started racing my friend down a long straightaway where we were going about 95 miles an hour. I was in the opposite lane, um, head to head with him the entire way until about 200 feet before the curve. A car was coming up and neither of us would budge. He wouldn't let me in and I wouldn't back off. And uh, finally he let me in. I swerved back in and slammed on my brakes because I knew the curve was there. And I thought I had time and it just went straight. And I remember slamming into the hill and everything goes black. 200 feet of skid marks and the car flew airborne, 42 feet, landed on its hood, turned. I got ejected from the driver's side door. Uh, It landed on me and the roof got crushed, killing my two friends instantly. I went to prison, sentenced to 15 years, suspended after seven. So while I was in prison, every so often I'd get a letter from a lady that I'd, I went to church with um, at the church before I went away. And um, she would just send me updates and pictures of the animals that are in her backyard. And uh, I just loved her so much and she loves me. And it just, it made my day, it made my month, it made my minute. Because every minute matters when you're forced to wait for every minute to pass. God just used her to bring me back to himself. So when I got out of prison, carrying the weight of of killing my two friends, all I wanted to do every day was just to die. I would would imagine myself driving into rivers and, and, and over highway bridges at like 120 miles an hour just to think about what it would be like for me to come up dead on the other side. I was just laying there one day after work Um, and I remember just being completely depressed and and just, just wanting to die. And God just spoke to me in the deepest part of my heart. I just, uh, I felt nothing but blackness and darkness. And that's the only way that I was able to hear God. Like, I didn't even know who he was or what he looked like or, or 
everything that I thought I knew was completely wrong. Um, and everything that I made God to be was wrong. Um, so I, that day, um, he showed me everything that was my life um, and that everything that was going, going to, to still be taken away. And I couldn't handle anything else being taken away from me because so much, I had taken so much and so much had been taken, I couldn't handle that. So he, I said yes to him. And I didn't know what that looked like, but I just said yes. And I gave him my addictions and my desires and my life. And I just started making better decisions. And Christina was one of those things, you know, I wanted a woman, I wanted a godly woman. We started hanging out and uh, she saw something deeper in me than, than I could even see in myself. And she saw through me the way she would look at me. And it broke me. It brought me back to understanding what love was in that and that I could actually be loved because I forgot that, that I'm lovable and that God loves me and that he showed me that love through her.